Well, hey, we've been, uh, man, I'm excited about today. We've been in a series for, uh, for several weeks. I think it's week seven, actually, in a series that we've called Gifted, talking about how each and every one of us are in Christ through the Spirit made for a purpose. And we've been talking about what that purpose is and how Christ has made us for a purpose. And uh, last week we began kind of part one, uh, accidentally, of a two, two message or two part message. Uh, on, on the sign gifts, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, and if you want to go ahead and grab your Bible uh, or phone or tablet, whatever you have, uh, we're going to be looking at that in just a minute. Uh, but last week and this week is a little bit more of a, like a Q&A kind of format. So uh, we'll, we'll kind of uh, forego the, uh, the fun jokes and stories this morning and kind of jump right in because uh, there's, there's a lot that we have to, to look at today, a lot of scripture, a lot of information, and... Uh, and uh, before we jump in, I'll go ahead and say this, just kind of preface that, that this passage that we're going to be looking at today, or this topic in general, is, uh, it's, it's been one of the most time-consuming, one of the most difficult, and I would say even one of the most frustrating topics or passages that, uh, that I've ever studied. Uh, and so uh, my, my uh, uh, challenge that I've had for the past couple weeks as I've been working on this, several weeks really, is, uh, is to speak truth and uh, but do it in kind of a, a timely fashion you know and that's always the problem of, of any preacher uh, is man there's so much that we could talk about but but here's kind of where we have to go today so I understand it might leave things out that you might have questions about uh, it might leave uh, certain uh, pieces of, of scripture out that I really wish we'd have time for uh, but let me just encourage you as, as I try to do every week, um, never just listen to what somebody up front says and take that as like God's truth. No, we, we actually, we live in a time unlike uh, ever in the history of mankind that we have so, uh, so much access to so much information. You can find um, just on, your, on a device you hold in your hand, you can find uh, multiple Bible translations, you can find articles upon articles and books and, and teachers uh, and, and, and preachers giving sermons and, and lectures on things that are so much better and loftier and more thought through than anything I could ever come up with, like on my best day. And so it's all at our fingertips. Like we have access to all of that. Uh, so let me encourage us, even as we study things today, that you would always kind of take, take whatever's being said home with you, in a sense, uh, and look at God's word and seek his face in this. Because I can promise you two things. Um, I promise you three things, actually. Number one, um, I'm not always going to be right. And that's uh, you know, a shock to some people. Don't tell my wife that. Uh, that's a shock. You know, I'm not always going to be right. The reality is I'm, there's just going to be times I'm going to be flat wrong. And, uh, and, and, you know, I'm a messed up person. So it's, it's just going to be that way. But, but another, these, these other two things that I think is important for us all to know is that every time uh, I, I study to prepare for a message, I'm doing two uh, significant seekings. Number one, I'm seeking truth. I'm not just seeking how I feel about something or how I think about something. And, and certainly there are times that those things get kind of mixed in together. But I'm just seeking truth. And I'm seeking the truth giver. I'm seeking God in this. Uh, and, and I think that's important for all of us that as we study, we're seeking God and we're seeking his truth. Uh, but I just want you to be confident in that, that, that I've spent time with God in prayer, desperately searching and seeking and looking for truth. Uh, and again, we're, we'll still mess up and we'll, we'll still have wrong angles and we'll still uh, have experiences that will kind of shadow over maybe what, what we find in Scripture. And there's things that we're still going to wrestle with and still going to be things that in the end we're going to have to say, I just don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'll tell you one day in heaven. Uh, but, but for now, we'll just do the best we can. And uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and uh, we'll read the passage that we read last week and, and, uh, and then kind of springboard into a, a passage in the book of Acts and kind of camp in those two passages for the most of the time this morning. Well, um, let's, let's go ahead and read that. 1 Corinthians 12, we'll start in verse 7. We'll go through verse 11. It'll be on the screen if you didn't bring anything with you. Uh, verse 7 says, To each, or to each believer, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance or the speaking of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, same Holy Spirit, we all have. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, the gift of prophecy. We talked about that uh, a lot more last week. To another, the, the ability to distinguish between spirits, discernment. 
And here's where we'll be today. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills, as God wills, as he wants to. He gives these gifts, not all of the gifts necessarily, uh, but he gives these gifts to his children. And as we've said each week, to build up the body of Christ, to build up the church, to carry out her mission. And as we uh, said, last, said last week, just kind of a quick recap, that God gives us each of these things as he wills to, to do that, carry out the mission. And, and among those spiritual gifts that God has given every believer, there are what we call sign gifts or miraculous gifts. And these sign gifts we see in Scripture, especially with uh, the ministry of Jesus and with the ministry of the first apostles, especially in their time, um, these miraculous or sign gifts, they confirmed the preaching of the gospel or they accompanied, accompanied as Hebrews 2 says, the gospel. So believers would uh, preach the gospel to unbelievers, to pagan believers, and, and kind of to back up what they were saying, that yes, this is the truth, there would be signs that would accompany them. And, and uh, Scripture says there, and he says uh, in other places, there would be things like tongues, and there would be miracles, and there would be prophecy, and there would be discernment of spirits, and there would be other things, healings even, uh, that would kind of back up those, those things, that, that truth, that gospel truth. And, and so each of those things are, are important. We'll unpack a little bit more of that as we go. So that being said, though, the first question that I want us to, to try to tackle today is just very simply this question. What is the gift of speaking in tongues? What is the gift of speaking in tongues? First time ever have I tried to, uh, to preach on this topic from this passage. Um, and, and like I said, one of the, one of the more difficult. So uh, you may know, probably if you've kind of been around the church world for any length of time, you may know that this question or this topic is one of the most highly debated and even one of the most divisive topics among Christians. And by that I mean there are some uh, Christians, uh, many Christians that believe... Uh, very strongly one side of this, and, and it has caused a division between them and others that believe very distinctly the opposite of it. And, and then, of course, as with all things, there's some people kind of in the middle, some people that could care less, uh, some people that are like, hey, whatever, you know, but, but there are certainly some, some polar extremes in this conversation, this discussion. And, uh, and that's, of course, why Paul is dealing with it here, because it was also the problem in the Corinthian church. At least it was one of the problems. But the, fact, the, fact, the sad thing is, uh, this is even close to one of the most important doctrines in Scripture. As a matter of fact, considering like maybe how little Scripture actually says about this, uh, you know, in, in relation to, to, to the all of the Bible, especially the New Testament, um, I would consider this probably one of the most minor issues or minor topics in Scripture, yet, um, as it was for the, for the Corinthian church, it became a pretty major issue. And, uh, and so it's a good question, I think. So what is the biblical gift of speaking in tongues? Well, there are three times that I found in the Bible that believers actually spoke in tongues. Three times. Uh, but only one of those actually gives any kind of like specific details. The other two, uh, Acts 19 and 10, I believe, like it just kind of says that it happened, but it doesn't really say anything uh, other than that. No details. But Acts 2 actually gives us quite a few details about what, what that meant. And so we're going to look at that. And that's kind of the main uh, passage we'll be looking at today. Acts 2, verse 1. We're just going to kind of uh, spend some time in this story. And here's what Scripture says. When the day of Pentecost arrived, there were all to, uh, they were, the, the apostles and those in the upper room, were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. I can't even imagine what that sounded like, other than a mighty rushing wind. But like, what did that sound like? Uh, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues, it's interesting that Scripture uses that word there, but uh, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. Let me just say, in my mind, I always see like Raiders of the Lost Ark, like, shh, you know, these little things like flying around. I don't know, but that's what I see. So, verse 4. Uh, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. So here it is. As the Spirit gave them utterance. And now there were dwelling in Jerusalem, kind of like meanwhile, uh, Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, this whoosh, uh, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered. 
They were surprised because each one was hearing them speak, the apostles speak, and all the people gathered in the upper room, they were hearing them speak in their own language. In verse 7, and they were all amazed and astonished, saying, are not all of these, uh, are not the, all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us not in Galilean language, but in our own native language? And so, kind of summarize that, Jesus had ascended to heaven, this was after his resurrection, he ascended to heaven, and many of his followers were gathered together in what scripture calls this upper room. And at this moment, Jesus, uh, what Jesus prophesied actually came to pass, and that's the Holy Spirit came on these believers in a way that had never happened before, and came into believers even. The Spirit's arrival made such a sound we see in that passage that it began to draw a crowd. But not just a crowd of the local people that happened to be around to hear it, but at that time there was a celebration going on in Jerusalem that, that people were gathered from all around the known world there in Jerusalem at this time. And you can say that's God's providence, of course. Not a coincidence. And so since there was, this was you know, really like a few years at least before this thing called Rosetta Stone was going to be uh, discovered, or I guess not discovered, maybe, um, or, or Google Translate or anything like that, there was only one way that all these people from all nations, with all culture, with different cultures and different languages that they spoke, there was only one way that one message was going to be communicated to them clearly at the same time. And it was if the Holy Spirit caused something to happen, there was a miraculous event to happen that would cause them to, when they spoke, speak in the many, many different languages of the people that, that were gathered around. And of course, it's exactly what happened. And so we continue, verse, uh, verse 12, Acts 2. The Bible says, And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, we kind of get in context, like the local people around, others mocking said, they're filled with new wine, like they're drunk. Uh, in verse 14, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, this is kind of funny, since it's only the third hour of the day, like if it was the ninth hour, maybe, but not the third hour. In verse 16, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and then in the rest of that passage, uh, Paul, uh, or, or not Paul, Peter, <laughs> eventually goes on to like preach the gospel, expound on the gospel according to the scriptures that they had at that time. And so while uh, the unbelievers heard the gospel in their own language, we see that the rest of the locals heard what, what just sounded like nonsense. Because they didn't know those languages that were being spoken. So they assumed that these uneducated Galileans must be drunk. It's just, I, I just find that humorous. But then Peter... Uh, stands up kind of among them, addressing them as essentially an interpreter, hearing all these things, and even probably speaking some of these things, to the local people, began to explain this kind of interpretation, what was being said, and then begin to call them to repentance uh, from their sin and to even be baptized. And as a result of this amazing miracle that accompanied the preaching of the gospel, we read in Acts 2, verse 41, kind of the end result was, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Amazing. So as we consider that biblical account, I think we uh, have five options, at least that I could think of. Five options for what speaking in tongues means. The first one is this. It's just another way of saying making out. Okay, just kidding. It's comedic <laughs> relief. Uh, while there might be some sneaky Christians that might, you know, teenagers that use, use that. No, that's not what it means. Okay, number two. Uh... What, what would it mean to be speaking in tongues? Is it nonsensical words made up by the speaker with nothing to do with the Holy Spirit? Like in this moment, I'm just going to speak this nonsense that has nothing to do with the Spirit. I'm just saying this stuff. Is it that? Well, we just read that's not at all what happened, right? So we can kind of cross that out of the list. So number three option. Nonsensical words, so it's still nonsense, but it's spoken by the speaker and anointed by the Holy Spirit. Giving those words meaning. So it's still kind of nonsense. It's not really a, a written language uh, with, with patterns and, and, and certain rules. But, it, but it's just kind of words just coming out of their mouth or syllables or sounds. But the Spirit anoints it in a sense and it becomes something else. And while that kind of sounds fun, that doesn't appear to be what happened in Acts chapter 2. Uh, because although the local crowd could not understand them, they said these guys must be drunk. 
the rest of the people could hear it in their own language. And scripture even goes on to, to give a list in verse 9, which we will read today, but you can see of, of what languages those were. There were very specific languages that came out of the apostles' mouths. And also, Paul makes it very clear in, in 1 Corinthians 14, which is a lot of like uh, details uh, that, that Paul gives on, on how maybe the, the gift of tongues can be used in the public worship service. But in 1 Corinthians 14, um, Paul deals directly in that, and he says in, in verse 7, if even lifeless instruments, saxophones, guitars, flutes, he says, or the harp, do not give distinct sounds, how will anyone know what is played? It's kind of an interesting concept. Or if the bugle, he says, uh, gives an indistinct sound, like a sound that it, it, it doesn't really fit what needs to be played, if it gives an indistinct sound, how will we get ready for battle? Or uh, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves... Uh, if with your tongue you utter speech that's intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you'll be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none of them is without meaning. So, so what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians 14, that there are many languages. You might not understand them, but there are many languages, and they all have meanings, and they all have distinct sounds, and they all have their purpose and their place in certain cultures. And so the distinctness of those notes that the instrument plays are important. Uh, and, and even what you just saw in the band. If, if the band, for example, earlier, um, and I've been a part of bands that did this before, just kind of played like whatever they wanted to, like in the moment, it would be chaos, right? I mean, it would be confusing, it would be horrible, it would be like, you know, the orchestra pit getting ready before the, the, uh, the orchestra presentation, like they're all tuning, you know, all that kind of stuff, or, you know, my daughter, she picked up a violin right now, and she might think, like, I can do this. You know, she starts playing, it just sounds bad, like there's nothing good coming from that violin. And that's kind of what Paul's point is here, that you need this distinct sound. You need something uh, um, that, that makes sense. As a matter of fact, what we see in Scripture is that word tongues in the Greek is glossa, which uh, the root of our English word, glossary. So it kind of makes sense. It, it's the same word as languages. The exact same word in Scripture as languages is the word tongues. And the word actually occurs over 50 times, or around 50 times in Scripture, talking about either the actual physical tongue in your mouth, or an actual language. Like, it is a language. And of course, we see it once or twice, uh, what we just read in Acts 2, like talking about kind of the, uh, maybe the forked tongues of a, of a flame of fire, or something like that. And so saying that, that true tongues is nonsense, it really just contradicts Scripture. That, that it, it can't be that. So here's op, uh, option number four of what speaking tongues is. It is a real heavenly language spoken uh, uh, by somebody that doesn't know the language, but through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes on them and they speak not in English language or not in a, uh, a, a Spanish language or not in earthly language, but they speak a heavenly language given to them through the Holy Spirit. And now this view is probably, uh, I would say, one of the most common among Pentecostal or charismatic kind of circles in the world today, uh, especially over the past century or so. Uh, and it's actually the same view held by several other religions that are even under the, the Christian umbrella, and, and some religions that are outside of the Christian umbrella, uh, including the, the Mormon church. That they believe that, that God gifts to uh, good Mormons the ability to, to speak and to hear kind of this angelic Language. As a matter of fact, that's how the Church of Mormon, the Church of Latter-day Saints, how it got its beginning. There was somebody that said, an angel spoke to me. I know only I could hear it, but it was an angel, I promise. And, and so they you know, wrote the Book of Mormon, and that's how it began. Summarize that a little bit. Um, but while, while this view sounds spiritual and even mystical, uh, maybe even in a good way, there are at least four problems with this view, that it's this heavenly language given by the Holy Spirit. Number one, it can easily distract the listener from the extremely clear gospel message because everyone's attention would be on the strange language. And that's exactly what happened here in, in, uh, in Acts 2, that for the unbelievers around, for the people from all kinds of nations under the heaven, they weren't confused. They actually hear, heard the gospel very clearly in their own language. And if... The gift of tongues, if this miracle, this sign gift, is to be used to proclaim the gospel, it must be clear. Number two, here's another problem with this view. It can divide believers into classes 
of, of common people and then the elite tongue speaking, heavenly speaking people that get their, you know, revelation from God that for some reason could not be communicated in their own language that had to be communicated in another language. So it, it has this tendency to separate. Like, sorry, you, you non-tongue speakers stay over here, but we tongue speakers are going to be kind of elevated a little bit. We're going to be up front. You need to listen to us. Which, which kind of goes to number three. Another problem is that even worse, this view can elevate the tongue speaker above God's written word in a way that no one else that doesn't hear it can argue. And that doesn't always happen with this uh, supposed gift of uh, heavenly language, but often it does. That, that the, the one speaking kind of gets elevated above God's written word, and some even believe that, that as they speak, it's, it's the same as the New Testament. It's the same as the apostles in, in, in Acts 2. Like, what they're saying is a new revelation from God, but not according to Scripture. And, and so, number four, we have another problem with this idea, is that Scripture, and this is possibly one of the biggest, Scripture never uses the phrase, Old Testament, New Testament, never uses the phrase, heavenly language. And while Paul actually does use the phrase tongues of angels or an, an angelic tongue, he does use that phrase, but really in 1 Corinthians 13, which is the one place he uses it, he's using it as kind of this exaggeration to make a point. Even if I spoke with the tongue of men or of angels and have not love, I'm just a sounding gong. And whenever an angel speaks in scripture, their message is not jumbled, it's not unclear, it's very clear, and their message is always incredibly important. Can you imagine Mary, you know, the angel comes down and begins to speak to Mary. You don't see Mary saying, I don't know what you said because it's a different language. No, somehow the angel spoke exactly in her language for her to be able to hear it. So if it is so clear in scripture, then where did this idea of an angelic language come from, or a heavenly language come from? Well, as I think we probably all know, that, that uh, what God does authentically at times, what God does for real at times, the devil loves to take and twist, and it become inauthentic, or become not real. And as we mentioned before, Paul is dealing with, with this Corinthian church that is, is being plagued by pagan beliefs, that have kind of made their way from, uh, from the system of the world into the church. And they begin to uh, kind of live in this ecstasy, manic, crazy kind of world. Like the more crazy it is, the more chaotic it is, the more you don't understand what they're saying, the more spiritual it must be. And that's what Paul was dealing with and why he was speaking here in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 about this topic. And it seems to be... That here in this first century church, there were some that were beginning to like copy this miraculous manifestation of the Spirit that came through the apostles, that spoke at Pentecost, and in many different languages. They were copying that in a sense, but, but synthesizing it, like making up their own language. And would say, like, hey, this is a new language, or this is a language maybe of people from other parts of the country. And of course, if no one was around that could understand that or interpret, interpret, uh, they were just getting away with speaking a false language. Now fast forward to the early 1900s, after a few centuries of huge reformations and revivals that, that I grew up hearing about all the time. Like these huge revival services where thousands upon thousands of people in the 1700s and 1800s and, and even some of the 1900s, people were getting saved out of cold, dead religion. Believers, in the beginning of the 1900s especially, begin wanting to keep those feelings going. Because we all do. I mean, man, when, when, we, when we feel something so strong, whether that's love or whether that's the Spirit coming in, whatever that is, we like for those feelings to keep going. And so here are the believers, in the early 1900s, wanting to keep that going, that they began to even fake it till they made it. And so they began to talk about a second work of the Spirit, or a second level, or a second filling of the Holy Spirit, because the first wasn't good enough, claiming that, that miracles were happening, and, and, and that people were speaking in other languages as the Spirit gave utterance, and it was an amazing, exciting time. But there was only one problem. As people began to hear them, and even these languages they began to take to other places where supposedly I'm speaking Chinese, God is giving me this utterance, and you begin to go to China, and you speak this language, and they say that's not Chinese. And people begin to discover this. And so this, this group of believers, which was kind of the beginning of the Pentecostal church, 
uh, begin to just kind of change their mind a little bit and say, like, just kidding, they aren't really real languages. These are unknown languages. These are heavenly languages. Exactly what was happening in the first Corinthian, uh, in the first century church in first Corinthians. Which reminds me, really, even as I read that, of like when I was a child. You know, I, I, I would see like, you know, Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan or something on a movie and, uh, or Three Ninjas Kick Back, you know. Uh, and, I, and I remember like, and I would go outside and I would think that because I saw it on TV that I could copy that. So I began, you know, karate chop and kick and, and you know, knock out the, the enemies that were trees and that kind of thing. And, 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 and I began to hear like languages, Chinese speaking, spoken on TV. And so I would go and I would say words or sounds that, that, that kind of, for me, sounded like Chinese. And like in my mind, like, I'm saying the right thing, you know. Or, and, and it wasn't Chinese at all. Or, or like, you know, so at some point through high school when you begin to like Spanish one and you think, oh, all I got to do is add an O or an A on the end of a word and it makes it Spanish. No, it doesn't. And so if the apostles and the other believers didn't speak a, a heavenly language, because that's not scriptural, and they didn't speak an angelic language, we don't see that in Acts 2, then what are we talking about? Well, I believe that according to scripture, the gift of tongues, at least what we see in scripture, is that it is a real human language, but unknown to the speaker, spoken by or through the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see in this text. Again, we see multiple examples of speaking in tongues in Scripture, but the only one that we have details about is this one, and in this instance, it was a human language, and we read that in, in verse 9, we see that list of human languages spoken by the person that they didn't know what they were saying, but it was coming out to a language that was understood, but it was by the Spirit. It wasn't human uh, intervention, it, it wasn't human gifting, it was spiritual gifting. It was the spiritual gift of tongues. And I've been in a couple meetings where someone was asked to pray. It happened actually about uh, four or five weeks ago. Someone was asked to pray in their own language. And I believe this last one, it was a, it was a South American language. And so he stood up and he began to pray. But there was no interpretation. And so, and so I remember like just this feeling of this is exactly what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 14. Like all this stuff came true. Again, 1 Corinthians, the, this whole passage we won't get to today, but you can study it on your own. But what Paul is saying is that when you speak in a language or a tongue that nobody in the room understands, and if there is no interpretation, then the body is not edified, the church is not built up, no one understands. And, and for me, if I didn't happen to know that like, hey, brother... Uh, John, will you stand up and pray in your own language? If I didn't know that it was actually another language, I would think it was nonsense. But even though I knew it was another language, it didn't help me. I had no idea what he was praying, and I've experienced that in other times. And it just like, hit me like, what if they're praying curses on all of us? Like, we don't know, because I don't understand the language. And that is Paul's point. And here's the deal. If a sign gift is a miraculous demonstration of God's power, and that's what we read, if it is this amazing, uh, miraculous demonstration of God's power accompanying the preaching of the gospel, then me standing up here and essentially saying nonsense or non-patterned words that are obviously not a language, it doesn't demonstrate that at all. But on the other side, if up here I just began to speak in fluent French or Ukrainian or Swahili, you would say, like, something is miraculously happening. And God will be glorified by it as I preach the gospel in those languages. It would be this very practical, obvious demonstration of God's power. Which leads us to the next question. That's similar, but a little bit different. And it's this. Does the Holy Spirit then give some believers a heavenly prayer language to talk to God? A prayer language. Now, uh... Uh, and let me say that like everything I said in, in the last question stands still in this. But is it possible that God can give somebody this, this different kind of language? Maybe it is a language. Maybe it's French. Maybe it's Spanish. Like in them. Or I don't know. Like, but, but can God give somebody a private prayer language? And the answer, my answer is really probably not. That this isn't like, okay, no, as I said in the first. That, that probably not. And, and so let me explain that a little bit. Um, and I hear a little bit more on the not than probably, but so each of the times that people spoke in other tongues in the Bible, it was in a public setting. Each of the three distinct times, it was in a public setting, not a private setting. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul, which begins to detail so much information about the gift of tongues, it begins to set parameters on the gift of tongues. 
which is important that we would uh, see our, or have our understanding through Scripture, especially that passage. In that passage, Paul is giving these instructions about a public gathering, not a private prayer time. And it's important that we see that. And it's, it's not how to guide our prayer, it's how to guide our gathering of believers, our worship services. Speaking in a language unknown to you in private, especially without an interpretation, does not match up to what the Bible is saying. So while there are men and women of God, some that I know personally, others that are well-known pastors and preachers and theologians even, that believe that a private prayer language exists or might exist, there are really no examples of it in Scripture. So that's why I say probably not. Because we, we don't see that necessarily exemplified in Scripture. Then where does this idea come from? When I kind of mentioned it earlier a little bit, but the only place that I can really find this idea of a private prayer Language, in a sense, it is in 1 Corinthians 14 when Paul says this. Uh, and again, he's referring to public prayer, not private. But he says this. Therefore, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 14, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, okay, I see it there. My spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. It's not helpful. I mean, I don't know what I'm praying. And, and often somebody that prays in an unknown prayer tongue, they, they would say that. I don't know what I'm praying, but I believe that God has given this to me, and, and he knows what I'm saying. But Paul is saying here, and I don't think he's saying this in a, in a good way, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do, he says in verse 15? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. That's what I should do. Not just with my spirit, but with my mind also. I will sing praise. So not just pray, but I will sing praise with my spirit. But I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit and not your mind, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? Like, of course. Again, the example I gave earlier of some of the meetings that I've been in. And I really think that Paul's point here is that if your spirit spoke, prayed, or sung a song in an unknown language without an interpretation... Which if you're by yourself, there can't be no one to interpret. Or Paul says, pray that you would also interpret. But if that's the case, then no one would benefit from that prayer, from that song, from that message. No one would be around to say, I agree with an amen. So instead, Paul says, pray in a language that you do understand. Or make sure there's an interpreter. Uh, interpreter? Interpreter? There we go. In the room. And thankfully, though, on this topic of praying. I, I, I love this personally. Thankfully, Jesus actually gave us some wonderful instructions on what our private prayer language should be. If you want to call it that. It is so simple. It is so concise. And it's so normal. And it's actually one of the most well-known passages of Scripture. It is what we call the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 9. And I'd just like for us to say this together. So join with me. Matthew 6, verse 9 says this. Together now. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. How short, and simple, and powerful, even is this model prayer that Jesus gave to us. And to clarify, Jesus actually said in the couple verses right before this, and I quote, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles or pagans do, because they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father actually knows what you need before you even ask him. What does he mean, don't heap up empty phrases? Other translations, other definitions say stammering. Don't use empty repeating, babbling, foolish talking. And I've heard that kind of prayer in the English language. You just kind of say the same thing over and over and over because you hope, like, if I say this long enough or I say the name of Jesus enough times or use as many names of God as I can, like, maybe God will hear me and the people will kind of be built up. And it's like Jesus saying, no, don't pray like that. That's how the pagans pray. Instead, just come to me because I know what you're praying for even before you ask. And if you want to connect to God deeply, you can just pray in your own language, whether that's regular English 
or that's King James English, or that's Redneck English, or that's Spanish or Swahili or anything else. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to use words audibly. You pray in your mind, God hears you. You pray in your heart, God hears you. There are even times, the Bible says, even when we have no idea what to pray for, Romans 8, 26, that the Spirit then intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. No words. Praying in our spirit. So moving on from the idea of tongues, here's question number three. Should I then expect a sign gift? Here's a sign gift that, that according to Scripture, accompanied the apostles and, the, and, and Jesus and the, the disciples and the uh, before the upper room, then uh, after the upper room, out here, and then as they preach the gospel, there are so many sign gifts and miraculous gifts. Should I expect a sign gift in my life? And this one's a little bit tougher because it kind of depends on what you mean. So let me break it down a little bit. If you're asking, when I get saved and receive the Holy Spirit, should I expect to speak in tongues? And the answer, of course, is no. And if anyone says that, they're, they're really running the risk of adding to God's grace. Because salvation is very clearly in Scripture, by grace, through faith in Jesus' incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his ascension, plus nothing, minus nothing. And we just have to be careful with say, ever saying that, that if the Holy Spirit was really in you, we would see this. And that's not according to Scripture. So then are we asking, when I really get full of the Holy Spirit, or when I really get saved, should I expect to speak in tongues? Like, maybe not the first time, but, but what if, like, something else comes upon me? Should I speak in tongues? And the answer is that is also no. And we should be always careful saying that anything is evidence of the Spirit in our life that was never actually evidenced in Jesus' life. We've never seen an example of Jesus speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, none of that in Scripture. Paul actually gives a, 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 a very good uh, and thorough explanation of what we can expect. So as an evidence of or as a result of the Spirit in our life. In Galatians 5, and, and the, the, more, uh, the, the less of us is in our life and the more of the spirit we have in our life, we see in Galatians 5, he says, you're going to have love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Like, those are the results. And I can promise you, that doesn't include the idea of self-control. That doesn't include, like, this kind of uh, wild falling on the floor or this rolling around or laughing uncontrollably or, or speaking gibberish and kind of this wild, like, manic crazy kind of thing that even Paul was dealing with then and that certainly what the church is dealing with today. And if you were to YouTube, which I did, um, speaking in tongues, you would, you would see evidence, you know, you'd see all that. And I just don't believe when Paul says the result of the Spirit is self-control, that that means you would lose control, right? And so believing that really getting the Spirit will result in crazy things happening causes, though, Christians to deal with what I dealt with Growing up as a child. So let me just kind of, you know, flash back to, to my life as a child growing up. Um, not in a Pentecostal church. Not even necessarily in a charismatic. They would never call it that. Um, it was an independent Baptist church. But what I experienced was people screaming and shouting and crying and running on top of pews and, and throwing things. There were times that, like, worship services just simply got wild. And so what I experienced as a child was, was I knew God had saved me. I knew it distinctly, but I wasn't experiencing those kind of wild expressions. And there were times that I remember as a child when I would see like people just bawling their eyes out in the room or lifting their hands and screaming. And I would think like, why isn't that me? Does that mean I am not saved? Does that mean I don't have the Holy Spirit? And let me say this, that, that the Spirit will absolutely at times move us to be expressive. It will, the Holy Spirit will move us to be emotional, yes. But probably not, as my brother recalled to me just this past week as I was talking to him kind of about our past environment. Probably the Holy Spirit won't drive us to running around screaming with a flower pot on our heads. Because that's exactly what happened the church I grew up in. And, and I wish like, we could have gotten that one on a video. That would, that would have been a good one. But I just remember like this... this anxiousness about me that like why don't I feel that and what happened was I began to try to make myself cry and, and it wasn't really working very well like I would think of you know cute puppies and like babies and stuff it just didn't really work very well Sarah McLaughlin wasn't playing in the background that would have helped so get that YouTube 
Uh, but if you're asking then this question, if God wants to use me to advance the kingdom of God in a humanly impossible way, will he step in and work a miracle or a sign? I would say yes. Like, resoundingly, yes. God has been telling his people that since the beginning of time. And, and Jesus said that, that exact thing to his apostles in Mark 16. Not because they were given more of the spirit than us, but because they were just simply completely sold out to the mission with no backup plan. That was the apostles. They were obedient to the calling to go and preach the gospel and to plant churches in face of persecution and even death. And God had a plan to use them that he said the gates of hell would not even prevail against it. And because of that, God worked miracle after miracle after miracle as he used the apostles in some amazing ways. And for centuries since then, God has still worked like that. Maybe we don't see it written down in kind of a nice, like, a several chapter book like the book of Acts. And it seems like, wow, everything just happened at once. But no, like over the course of centuries since then, God has worked some amazing miracles in the life of believers that were obedient and sold out on mission. Go read stories of men like Billy Graham or even locally Jerry Falwell. Read stories about a man named George Mueller who ran an orphanage in Tennessee that cared for thousands and said up to 10,000 of orphans over 60 years. And in his journal, George Mueller recorded specific prayers that were answered over 50 years thousand times. 50,000 answers to prayer because he ran his orphanage just completely on faith. He wouldn't ask people for help. He just relied on faith. And I remember distinctly one story that they, the, the, the orphans would gather together at the table like with their forks and their napkins and their plates ready with no food and they sat down and prayed in a truck, a food truck broke down next door. And it's like, well, no, this food is going to waste. So somebody needs to eat it. Like 50,000 answers of prayer George Mueller recorded in his life. That's every single day, sometimes more than one a day for 60 years. Why? Because instead of just doing what he could in his own strength, he set out to an obey God and attempt great things for the cause of Christ. And those things are nothing for God. Because what's, natural, what's supernatural for us is just natural for God. God is the God of the impossible. And heaven only knows what God would do and wants to do today in our lives, in your life, and in my life. If we really got to the place, myself included, where everything was on the line, all we had was a reliance on God. There was no plan B, and we obediently attempted great things for Him with prayer and fasting. God can do whatever He wants. Whenever he wants, with whomever he wants. Because here's the thing. Our salvation itself, we talked about this last week, is a miracle. That God would take us who are hopelessly dead in our trespasses and sins and make us alive in Christ. So let me tell you this. Every time that we get an opportunity to lead somebody else to Christ, to salvation, we are witnessing a miracle. Not a temporary miracle like healing, but an eternal miracle of a soul. And we may have, never, may have never thought of it, but I believe there are miraculous in interventions, healings, prophecies, visions, and other signs that happen right in front of our eyes all the time that we never acknowledge or recognize as such. All you have to do is read scripture and see how God is always at work behind the scenes, doing things that would blow our mind if we really knew what was going on. Think about the conservation of scripture itself, that here we are reading documents that are at times thousands of years old, and they're just as God intended them to be. It's a miracle. This week I talked to several people in person and online and heard about some amazing miracles that God worked. Heard how God brought people together. I heard how God blessed the family with the birth of a child after the doctor said it would take an act of God and it did. Uh, heard how God healed a grandmother of breast cancer. How God brought a man back to life and, and, and quite a few more. Healed from depression and many other things. And even this week, Sam and Amy, uh, God protected musical equipment in their home when a, a pipe burst and poured water everywhere except on that equipment. Why? Because that equipment was used not just weekly, but many times daily for God and his church. God works miracles all around us, even though we don't recognize it. Often. And those things, as I said, are nothing 
for God. So should we expect miracles in our life as we follow God? I really think yes. And if you haven't noticed any, I just think we're looking in the wrong place. And now I recognize, um, even as I say those, kind of answer to those three questions, as we kind of head toward the end of this morning, I recognize that you may have a different view on some of these things. And so let me kind of ask this, answer this last question this morning. What if I disagree? What if I disagree with this? Well, first, let me say this. Let us not ever hold a closed-fisted, unrelenting opinion on anything that we've never studied from Scripture ourselves. We have access today, as I mentioned before, to so much information. We must never just follow our feelings or experiences. There are times that we will feel strongly about ideas or beliefs that are really just an immature view of Scripture. I've done it. I've been there. Always be learning. Always be rooting your beliefs in truth. But also let me say this. Let's talk. If you disagree, let's talk. Talk about it amongst yourselves. Talk about it in your small groups. Talk about it to family members. The, the beauty of being a church is that we are all made up, or that we are made up of all kinds of people with the Spirit of God as our bond. Not agreement necessarily on every issue as our bond. The Spirit of God as our bond. And the Spirit of God teaches us to be unified and harmonized together with believers. We must never allow topics that the Scripture does not really give a lot of clarity about to divide us. So pretty much, let's be unified by the gospel and let's just talk about the rest. And we all have to fight against this temptation to let our beliefs give us like this elitist attitude over top of others that believe differently. Let me just say I have wonderful friends in my life that, that do believe differently on even these things that we said this morning or other things. And instead, thirdly, what if I disagree? Pursue unity, not division. Pursue unity, not division. I love what T.D. Jakes, who is a Pentecostal pastor, but I don't really agree with everything that he says, but he really says it well, so I like to listen to him. He said a couple years ago this statement, it is easy to throw rocks at people that you don't know, but the more you really get to know them and see how Christ works in their lives, regardless of their belief system, you begin to try to be a bridge builder. Don't construct walls up against people you disagree with, but be a bridge builder. For the sake of the gospel, recognizing in humility that none of us have all the answers. And I also love what John MacArthur, who is on the really the opposite spectrum in the Christian world from T.D. Jakes, he said this. He's very theologically conservative. And he said, you would be better off to go into a corner and speak gibberish than to come out of the corner and gossip. Wow. <laughs> If your gospel makes you an ecstatic, emotional worshiper in church services, but a crappy, abusive husband or a nagging, mean wife, I don't believe you're believing the right gospel. The true gospel calls us not necessarily to speak in a, in a tongue that we don't know, but to repent of our sins, to die daily to ourselves, to take up our crosses, to live holy lives, to preach the gospel to others, to love God and to love others. Fourthly, what if I disagree in closing? Let me invite the band to come up as we close with the song, kind of in response. Fourthly, what do I do if I disagree? Let me say this. This is huge. I hope we get this. Do not seek the miracle over the miracle maker. Do not seek the miracle over the miracle maker. What do I mean? Do not get so caught up in wanting to experience some kind of manifestation of the Spirit that you forget to seek the giver of that manifestation. Seek Jesus. Pursue Jesus. He is the perfect that Scripture says has come. The spiritual healing He provides lasts forever. And oh, we do that. We do that even in human relationships. We do that even sometimes in love relationships that we, we so seek after this feeling that we forget that there's a person on the other side. But let me say on, on this, kind of flip it around. Also, may we not be so extremely doctrine and knowledge chasing that you forget to chase after a relationship with Jesus Christ. So don't chase the experience and the feeling, but don't chase just information either. Jesus actually told the Pharisees and Sadducees in John 5 who, who would fall into that camp. They, they just sought after like fact and, and information and prophecy. He said that in, in uh, John 5, he said, you search the scriptures for eternal life, but you miss the very Jesus that the scriptures 
are talking about. He says, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Oh, church, may that not be us. Yes, may we desire spiritual gifts that God can use us to build up the church, to, to reach uh, the, our world around us, to reach Churchville and Swope and, and all of Augusta County, Waynesboro, everywhere around, that God would use us. May we, let's seek those gifts. That's great. Desire to be used by God. And yes, may we seek truth and knowledge and wisdom. But as John MacArthur also said, dead orthodoxy can never replace a warm and a vital relationship with God. So just kind of in response, there's so much more that I'd love to say about, about this topic and about this passage. Please read that. But let's end with just this thought. It is amazing what God will do through just one person. We've told some of those stories. Just one person who was just sold out and open to the spirit leading and working in their life. Just imagine what God can do and will do through a whole church full of people willing to do that. Just selling out. Just being obedient. Just going after the calling that God has in our lives. But it's not going to be through seeking an experience or knowledge. It's going to come through just seeking Jesus. Let's be Jesus seekers. And through that, just allow him to use us in some amazing ways. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word, and I pray as your Holy Spirit speaks to us, illuminates the truth in our hearts and our lives, uh, and maybe even things that, that we're wrestling with, uh, maybe for some that, that didn't know that they should care, and today maybe they're reminded that, God, your word is, is true, and your word is quick, and it's powerful, and, and what you said we need to listen to. God, even more than that, may we, just as we said, be, be seekers of you, not seekers of what you do. God, I pray that you would use these, uh, these people, God, that you would use us, that you would use me individually and as a group. God, use us together God, to make a difference, even miraculously, in the world around us. Not for ourself, not for our name, or even the name of, of any church, but for the lifting up of the name of Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you that, that as we do that, you as, as a good father, as we're about to sing about, you promised that you would not just set us in motion and leave us, but that you would go with us every step of the way through your Holy Spirit. We trust in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.